welcome to the second session for today. So in the previous lecture we talked about the need for turbulent floaters, right? So in this lecture we will limit ourselves only to the modeling of Reynolds stress and subgrade turbulent stress floaters. As the name suggests, Reynolds stress closure means we are going to talk in terms of RAMs. When we are going to talk about subgrade turbulent stress closures, we are going to talk in terms of LES. Okay? As I probably mentioned earlier, this is going to be a long lecture because it is extremely rich topic. I will not claim that everything will be covered, but at least you will know the most important bits and hopefully that will motivate you to go to the right place and seek more knowledge. Okay. So, first in the context of RAMs. Now, this is the Reynolds stress. I am writing for compressible flow just for the sake of effectively generalization purpose because some of the terms will drop out in the case of incompressible flow. It's firstly, an algebraic closure in the sense you are not solving any transport equation. So this is an unclosed terms. Six components we told, and they are closed using this expression, which is commonly referred to as Boltzmann's hypothesis. It's another way of essentially telling the gradient hypothesis for Reynolds stresses. Here, let me explain a couple of things quickly. This is essentially divergence of temper and mean velocity. Does not equal to zero in compressible flow. But if you replace the temper and mean by Reynolds mean, for incompressible flow, this part is exactly equal to zero. Clear? Because divergence of mean velocity is zero. Why this one survives? If you consider the trace of this tensor, then trace of this tensor is going to be minus rho EY double prime minus EY double prime. Clear? What will be trace of this delta IJ? <coughs> delta II is going to be 3. So this part will give you 2 delta UI del XI. That one and this contribution will essentially cancel. Right hand side we are going to get times rho bar times k delta, which is identical to the trace of this. So the, this term is there from the point of view of the realizability constraint. Realizability constraint means that the left hand side should become right hand side. Okay? From the point of view of consistency. Now As this equation boils down to this, very often people generally use this expression for incompressible flow. You can clearly see this term is zero for, and that's why it doesn't appear any. But I still have to consider this. Clear? At this point, I want you to please reflect and appreciate it's a model it's not an exact relation okay from where does this model come if you consider the, the logic is from kinetic theory of gas analogy but turbulent eddies are not isolated molecules Essentially, the mean free path between the molecules in kinetic theory of gas is much larger in comparison to the molecular dimension. 
That's not the case. Integral length scale effectively is not that large in comparison to the data. Okay? Correlations work in a different manner. So we borrowed the concept from the kinetic theory of gas, but the underlying assumptions for turbulent flow field are very, very different from what happens in the case of the gaseous molecular motion. Okay? So there is no reason to actually believe that just because I have come up with an expression and it expresses an unclosed term in terms of the mean quantities which I already know, it has to be a correct expression. Okay? Now, let's consider this one for the time being because most of the time in this lecture, I'll actually focus on this aspect because most of you, most of the time, will deal with incompressible fluid motion. I'll imply what extra you need to do for compressible flow towards the end. So this is our AP kinematic viscosity. Just to give you the context, look, it is written like this. This is material property to the extent because rho bar density T is a material property. Clear? But this one is not a material property, the kinematic very viscosity. It's a flow property. So it is actually it can be expressed as some kind of characteristic turbulent velocity scale, characteristic length scale of turbulence. Okay? The usual candidate for expressing a turbulent velocity fluctuation scale comes from turbulent kinetic energy. Okay. That is a scale we cover half. Kinetic energy is what? Half of EY UI, right? So it's a dimension is velocity squared. So square root of velocity gives us a measure of turbulent velocity fluctuation. Happy with that? L term, the leg scale, based on last two days discussion, you can appreciate comes from there. Right? Clear? Yeah. It basically follows from what I told on the first day. We already solved a problem yesterday where we used epsilon is equal to u prime q over l, and that basically is rearranged here. Nothing else. So if I multiply u term times l term, essentially the dynamic viscosity, any viscosity scales as this, k square over epsilon. Clear? So if I actually now put a proportional parameter, c mean, this is what you get. Clear? Now, very often C mean is taken to be 0 0.09. For variable density flows, we basically express it in terms of Febre average kinetic energy, Febre average rate. The expression remains exactly the same. Hopefully, it's clear up to this point. So, in order to make this model to work, or this model to work, I need to give kinematic eddy viscosity, right? That's the my major challenge, and that comes from this. So if I can actually have the knowledge for k and epsilon, I should be able to get my kinematic eddy viscosity. And that is really the motivation behind k and epsilon model. Clear? Couple of things. Effectively, fundamentally, I want a turbulent velocity scale, a length scale. Sometimes, and there are things in the literature where you solve for a transport equation for turbulent magnetic energy, but instead of solving for epsilon, you actually solve for the length scale. Idea is exactly the same. Okay. 
sometimes in commercial codes like Fluent, if you go for setting up the, the boundary condition for inlet, you will see it asks for a length scale. Basically, what it does, it actually uses this kind of formula to actually estimate epsilon. Okay? Internally, that's what it does. It probably you might remember, if you have used fluent, it asks you about turbulence intensity, which is basically root mean square velocity fluctuation divided by the mean velocity that you have specified. And from there, it actually estimates k. Once it estimates k, effectively, if you keep the length scale, it back calculates epsilon. Clear? So when you are specifying those values in your drop-down menu in Fluent or any other commercial software, that's what is happening inside. I showed by this time the exact transport equation for k several times. Now this becomes a model transport equation. Okay? And this is also a model transport equation for epsilon. All the modeling assumptions can be questioned. Okay. It is more rigorously modeled for k equation. Epsilon equation is modeled based on mostly dimensional perspective. Really, I need epsilon to close the system. So modeling is more arbitrary for this one. Okay. Sometimes some codes really do not consider the convergence of epsilon equation that strict. That's the reason. This is turbulent frontal number for turbulent kinetic energy, similar turbulent frontal number for epsilon. Here you have one model constant which is often taken to be 1.44. This is a model constant which is taken by 1.92. They are not perfect. Very often people play with these numbers. And if people have seen this uh, that sometimes for certain flows these numbers need to be changed. They are well documented in the literature, but these are the standard values. So if you actually go to any kind of commercial code, you'll find these values are listed there. Doesn't mean these values are perfect. Why these values? Because effectively these values have been benchmarked for a large range of flow conditions, mainly for decaying homogeneous isotropic turbulence that fully developed turbulent boundary layer fish air flows. Okay. I'm telling mainly there are exceptions where it will not work exactly. Okay. So whenever you are seeing the default values, take them the pinch of salt. But also good idea not to actually tune them arbitrary, at least. See what the results are. Go back, find what the limitations of this model are, identify those before you actually start fiddling with the model parameters. Now, here I have got another possibility of a model which is called K omega model. Effectively, the logic remains exactly the same. I need to have a velocity scale and a length scale. Okay? Now, if you consider, instead of saying that, if I tell I need a velocity scale and time scale. Okay? Velocity times time will give me a length, right? So I can generate that. So I can alternatively tell, okay, I need a velocity scale and a time scale. Time scale, basically, I, although I have written with equal to, for purpose of understanding, 
concept of that as a scale in the relation. So that is epsilon over q. This has a unit of meter square by second cube. Here it is meter square by second square. So effectively, this has a unit omega of 40 of strength, one over second. Okay. And if you basically say that square root of k divided by omega, square root of k will have a unit of velocity meter per second. One over omega will have a unit of second. You get length scale, and that basically gives you another alternative expression for the uh, any kinematic viscosity. You can see you are going to get the similar things. If you put epsilon over k, it will come out to be c omega k square over epsilon, nothing else. Happy with that? So that's it. The logic behind another very well known turbulence model called k omega. Effectively, if you start with this equation, these two equations, and if you come up with a model transport equation for epsilon over k using this, you will be able to actually get this transport equation or omega. The logic is instead of solving epsilon, I'm solving for omega. Okay. What is the arithmetic? Come to that. Thanks for your question, but please wait a little bit. Come to that. These are model parameters. The values are given here. The same things that I talked about model parameters are valid, so I'm not going to repeat. So all the cautionary remarks that I made earlier, please be aware of this. Just because I now, I'm now solving for omega, not epsilon, the molecular dissipation term now needs to be written in terms of omega. It's written So there are various variants of k epsilon model, standard high Reynolds number k epsilon model, low Reynolds number k epsilon model, RNG k epsilon model, realizable k epsilon model. If you already used to it, you must have seen these names in the drop down. This one is not there in the drop down menu. But if you know how to actually program using the user-defined function, it is there, but it's hidden. Now, let me explain what these variants are and why the variants exist. There must be a reason why the variants exist, and that will answer your question eventually. So, in the standard high Reynolds number k silent model, you basically use the transport equations for k and epsilon, but you do not solve them up to the wall. The first big point in the wall normal distance is assumed to be in the log layer or the inertial layer. In order to ensure that, you have to do this, where this is the friction velocity. Now, this will not come as a surprise because we have already done that in one of the tutorial questions. And that was the whole logic of doing the tutorial question to prepare you for this. Okay? So, effectively, the solution procedure that we followed that day that leads to these expressions, you might remember, first tutorial. So, essentially, I can take the friction velocity in terms of turbulent kinetic energy. I can get the dissipation rate for this point, based on all of this, C mu is a model constant, K is turbulent kinetic energy, kappa is von Karman's constant, yp is the distance. Clear? 
So I'm not solving all up to this point. I'm just basically telling at this point I'm going to actually use the values and that's what I'm solving. Clear? Yeah. Yes. And similarly, I can actually get my y plus value in this bar. Very often in the code, instead of writing y plus, they write it as y star. Because it's an approximate y plus value. What I'm writing here, instead of putting in tau exactly, I'm using this one, and that's how I got the y star. Very, very important practical thing. Once you have run a parallel problem using epsilon model, you have got one solution. Don't forget to actually check your y plus values and ensure the y plus value that you have got that is consistent with the model requirement. If you are using standard I Reynolds number epsilon model, and your y plus is less than 40, then you are in trouble. You need to actually coarsen your mesh rather than refining your mesh next to the wall to ensure that the model is doing what it is supposed to do. Clear? This is a one example that instead of refining your mesh, you have to coarsen it. Clear? Now, high Reynolds number of standard caves of the model does reasonably good job in capturing the global flow features. But if you are interested in what happens close to the wall, so what kind of flow that might be, if you are interested in actually estimating your in friction crack. If you are interested in heat transfer, then you have to actually come close to the wall because these things are happening at the wall itself, right? Then it is a good idea not to actually go for the solar model. I think one other thing I need to tell that at the wall, because of mostly condition k is generally put as zero but that makes the equation extremely steep. I know of people who actually use del k del y equal to zero as a Newman boundary condition at the wall. That means the solution will yield some non-zero k value at the wall, which is unphysical, you just ignore it. Because you don't do anything with k value at the wall. But apparently, it improves the convergence rate, keeps the solution. It makes the code work better. Personally, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with del k del y equal to zero, because physically, K must be zero at the wall because of the uh, no slip conditions. Okay. Sometimes, if the standard wall function gives you trouble, you can go for something called non-equilibrium wall function. That is also there in fluent star CDC effects as a compromise. Effectively, if your y plus is less than 11.6, that means if you are in the buffer layer, then k and epsilon can be estimated. Okay? So, again, I want to emphasize why y plus needs to be checked. If you see that with your mesh, it is coming less than 40, even less than this, then don't use standard wall function, go for different wall function, non equilibrium wall function, if you cannot force in your mesh. Okay? 
Now, if you are interested in the physics which is happening right at the wall or very close to the wall, like things water where is happening in the viscous somewhere, then good idea that you actually get away from the standard high reverse number capsule go for low Reynolds number capsule model. Low Reynolds number capsule model I have heard so many times from the students. Does it mean it actually is valid for low Reynolds number? No. For high Reynolds number capsule model, does it mean it is valid only for high Reynolds number? No. What it basically tells me like low Reynolds number capsule model that you actually go right up to the wall. You actually go even in the viscous sublayer. So if you think in terms of Y plus as a Reynolds number, because it's right, it's a really a Reynolds number. When you're going to viscous sublayer, that Reynolds number is small. So it enables you to go right to the wall. You are solving the equations right up to the wall. Clear? And you use this to boundary conditions. K equal to zero because of the no slip. That's how long is given by this kinematic viscosity. This time not any kinematic viscosity, but the kinematic viscosity and second derivative of K. Your grid resolution such that y plus must be less than 5. In other words, ensure you are already in this subject. Smaller, the better. Clear? Now, think about it that I am really actually demanding very, very high resolution of the near wall region. When I'm talking about y plus less than 5, my grid size is, is very, very fine. It's not hugely different from a TNS simulation. Obviously, you are not going to, to use the same. If you are doing the simulations sensibly, you are not going to use a uniform mesh. You will probably have a bias. You will have, you have a non-uniform mesh. But still, the requirement is quite draconian in that sense, that you really have to have really small nest types. There are some modifications. This if mean essentially comes in, this is a damping factor. As you go close to the wall, because of the presence of the wall viscous action, the velocity fluctuations will actually dampen. So the conventional C mu value is not going to work close to the wall. Okay. Another important thing to notice: these things are going to change. If here I have got F1 or an F2 value, this treatment is also new in the case of the low Reynolds number capsule. When this C epsilon 1 and C epsilon 2 were calibrated, very often people invoked local equilibrium, that means production of kinetic energy is equal to dissipation rate of kinetic energy. That only holds in the logarithmic layer or in the shear layer. If you come very close to the wall when you are talking about viscous sublayer, that assumption breaks down. So effectively, this F1, F2 are attempts to essentially change the values of C epsilon 1 and C epsilon 2, effective values of C epsilon 1 and C epsilon 2 contributions. So the expressions are given here. This is one of the variants of Launder and Sharma uh, model. Now limitations, coming to your point, it doesn't work accurately for square linear 
recirculating flows, flows with secondary flow features, non circular channels. Okay. If you are talking in terms of aerodynamic flows, flow around an airfoil, as you come towards the stagnation point, it gives you unrealistic high kinetic energy production rate at the, the, the stagnation point. Okay. Now, then what happens to the other alternative? In comparison to Cape Solon model, it is highly sensitive to the free stream turbulence. So large scale motion, whatever is happening, it very easily affects the prediction of K model. Okay? That feature is not there in Cape Solon. The stagnation point problem is still there. So some of these issues can be avoided into the later versions of the Epsilon model. One of them is RNG Epsilon model. Again, as I can tell you, influence that version is available. It's a renormalized group. Model. Effectively, you actually solve an ordinary differential equation. You get K and epsilon, but for evaluating the KD viscosity, you don't put K square over epsilon times C mean. Okay? Instead, you actually use K and epsilon and basically solve for this differential equation where this new hat is basically mu e, that is kinematic viscosity divided by molecular kinematic viscosity plus one. And effectively, you get whatever value of this one new hat, based on that, you actually specify your KD viscosity. Clear the idea? So Value of C uh, C gamma is 100. They are kept. Value. There are for all models. There are lots of variations. This is the standard. Value. So I don't. They are written like uh, like mu q minus 99. Like because as I told you that other researchers change this value. Okay. If you want, keep keep it. Okay. It makes no difference how it is written. The, concept is more important. Okay? So generally for high Reynolds number, the C effective C mean value turns out to be this, which is slightly different from the conventional 0.09 value. Okay? And you can actually come up with some kind of uh, revisions for external pressure gradient. Generally, RNG Epsilon model is used with non-equilibrium valve functions, and where effectively you use this one for the external pressure gradient techniques. From basic fluid mechanics, you know hopefully that if you have adverse pressure gradient, your flow is more susceptible to flow separation. That will essentially give rise to recirculation bubble. So, standard cave zone doesn't work very well when you have lots of recirculation. So, that means standard cave zone model is not very good when it comes to external pressure gradients, especially adverse pressure gradients. RNG cave zone model does that better. Clear? Now, Whatever I have said so far is fine, but C mu value, which people propose 0 0.09, or the way we just discussed, we value it. 
doesn't mean it is going to be given to the hell gun. I have to ensure some physical constraints are fulfilled. Can you have a negative hello of K? Is it allowed? No, by definition, it, 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 it's UI, UI, right? So it's basically square, never, it, the lowest value is zero, right? Can you have negative value of this equation? No. So, in order to actually ensure that these three relations are three physical conditions that one has to actually ensure, I'm giving you the hint in the afternoon to come back to this. That is going to be our tutorial question. Essentially, a very famous turbulence researcher called Paul Darwin came up with these three relations. And effectively, that means C mu is not constant, it depends on the local strain rate condition. The problem that I talked about regarding the stagnation point, that problem is solved in this one because of that. Okay? Model of dissipation rate transport equation takes this form. You can clearly see the strain rate contribution comes here. Sij is the strain rate tensor. This Sij is in terms of the, the average velocity. Evaluated just an average velocities. Even in this manner, as I have shown. And here, U star, effectively, the C1 is dependent on the spread rate magnitude. C mu is evaluated based on this, where strain rate magnitude as well as the vorticity magnitude, this is the anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor related to vorticity. So both strain rate and vorticity effects, the local flow feature effects are taken into account. And C mu is no longer constant here. Now, similar to the developments of K epsilon methodology to improve its predictive capabilities, the people have used the advantages of k epsilon and k omega modeling. We talked about the limitations, right, before. Now, I have talked about how you can actually address some of the limitations in the k epsilon thing, but k omega also has its limitations. So all those things are now combined together so that in our part uh, uh, of the boundary layer, the model directly is usable right up to the wall to the viscous sublayer. So you can use this SST, shear stress transport, A omega model, like a low Reynolds number K epsilon model right up to the wall. Clear? So you can actually consider that as a low Reynolds number turbulence model. Once again, Low Reynolds number doesn't mean that it is globally Reynolds number is low. Basically, it goes into the low Y plus region as well. Okay. As I said, it basically it combines the best of both worlds. When K epsilon was not sensitive to whatever happens in the the free stream, so it makes it less sensitive to the free stream. But it actually we. Uh, sort of finds the common K omega problem in that respect. So this effectively gives us the K omega model. Equations solved after the wall, but great resolution needs to satisfy Y plus less than one. At this point, the great resolution requirement just at the wall 
is not very different from DNS. In DNS, generally the Y plus catalog, if you are doing for uh, a channel flow DNS, Y plus value close to the wall typically is less than 0.6. So you can understand, although you are doing RANs close to the wall, the grid resolution requirement is quite severe. But you will see that on this later on. New T is evaluated like this. Once again, S is the strength that might be should. Other parameters are given here. Okay. But you will see one important bit. These are model parameters. They are not constants. They are functions of local flow features. Okay. Now, if, if you can tell me that from where this hyperbolic tangent comes, why mean, max, all of those things come, they are for, to some extent, to actually uh, satisfy the realizability part and to some extent is basically looking at the experimental results or the DNS results and basically to some extent fitting the curve. So there is a bit of empiricism involved. If you are working in turbulence, you have to access that level of empiricism. Okay? talked about the possibility of solving a transport equation for redox stress. And people understand that you are doing a strong assumption by telling that I am using gradient hypothesis, that's why I am using Guzani's assumption. Instead, you can tell, I want to know all physics which is affecting my Reynolds stress. I'm going to solve the transport equation for six independent Reynolds stresses. Obviously, that will involve proliferation of unknowns. You need to consider a lot of models. I'm not telling necessarily the final outcome will be more accurate than any dispositive models which we have discussed so far. But this is an established modeling methodology. A lot of work has gone in in this respect. Basically, Rij given by this is expressed in this manner. Effectively, what you have here, production, that's pressure strain rate. You have molecular diffusion, the transports of RIJ because of vorticity, finally because of the model. And this one, PIJ and PIJ, this is the, the molecular diffusion production, this is the, the pressure contribution, this is the because of the vorticity, and this is the molecular dissipation contribution. Okay? Physically, that's what they mean. So first, diffusion, production, pressure strain, this one because of the vorticity, this is molecular dissipation. <coughs> These two terms are closed, everything else is closed. Okay? When I say production, that means it that generates. When I say that means it kills every other term effectively is a redistribution term. That means I already told you, take something from here, take something like that. Now, pressure strain correlation effectively is split into a rapid part and a slow part. I'll explain what rapid part and slow part means. Rapid part is the interaction of the fluctuating velocity field with the mean velocity field dependent on mean strain rate and mean rotation rate. The simplest form is this. You can understand this is the simplest form. 
there are in principle you can invoke more tasks there. And those models do exist in the literature. Okay? So it involves the auditory part of the Reynolds stress tensor, C1, C2, C3 are different model constants. There are several models which include a LRR model. You'll see that it's their influence. Similarly, you will have species of Sarkarbaski model. SSG model is also available on fluent. But essentially the treatment is different. Okay. Slow term is responsible to return to isotropy. I told at the small scale turbulence behaves like a homogeneous isotropic turbulence. That basically tries to bring turbulence to that. Basically, tries to reduce the anisotropy of the renal stress. And generally model in this. There are various variants, but most common variant I have shown. Okay? C4 and C5 model constants, low part, can be modeled by rota model. There are also other models like sulfur and special model as well. There are different variants. These are the two most well-known ones. There are more. Okay. So it's a very, very rich literature, but I'm just giving you the fundamental concept so that you can go and read on the DVD. Rotational term is expressed in this manner, but epsilon here is not dissipation. This is basically your permutation symbol. You must have used that epsilon ijk as permutation symbol. So that's that one. Dissipation term is either model like this. So that means you just have the diagonal terms. All non-diagonal terms are zero. And basically, diagonal term is two times epsilon means dissipation error of kinetic energy divided by three. That's the kind of thing. Alternatively, you can come up with more complex models. And there are other models as well. Okay? So, summary. Nutshell, you would basically have low Reynolds number model that means meet out wall function it goes right up to the wall. That means high Reynolds number model means you are not going right up to the wall, you are going somewhere <coughs> up to a certain distance. The rest you rely upon wall function. Standard epsilon. This is epsilon longer and So whenever you are using epsilon model, whenever you write any thesis, any report, please specify which version of epsilon. Because it means very, very different things. Okay. If you are by any chance you are using high Reynolds number model, Tell what wall function is That's also important because just the model name is not sufficient. Clear? LRR, that is now Reynolds stress and epsilon transport. You might understand why epsilon transport because it basically considers epsilon ij as 2 over 3 epsilon on the diagonal. SSG is a letter. They all need wall functions. Okay? K omega SST, these two 
don't need any kind of problems. So they go all the way up to the I talked about RFG model, pre normalized group tape salon. I talked about realizable tape salon model. Just for completeness sake, you might say that P is not going to be negative, F someone is not going to be negative. These things you can tell from your common sense. Why didn't people actually consider them to begin with? Because that hindsight is a great thing. One things have happened. Then it is very easy to actually go back and tell, oh, if I could do these things differently, things would have been different. I think when Jones and Lauder came up with this model, nothing similar to this existed ever. So it was a great achievement at that time. If you actually look at this paper, I think this is several thousand times several 10,000 times it has been cited. Effectively, you will see in the afternoon that when you actually do the analysis, then it seems fairly obvious that those realizability <coughs> relations need to be respected. But they are not so straight, straightforward to begin with. It's like solving a difficult problem. Very one, often, once you actually solve the problem, somebody gives you the solution, it looks like very easy. But when you do it for the very first time, it may not be easy. So that's why essentially realizable tape salon came at a much later stage. Just because this one gave rise to that problem at the stagnation point, that led people to think that why it is giving that, and that led to the development of the realizable yeah, so Have I answered your question so far? Fine. So you asked about strengths and limitations. I believe I answered your question. Now a case study. That's what it does. This is a channel flow. I have put a constant heat flux from the top wall and bottom wall, and it's a fully developed channel. I have the 3D DNS results for this, but when you consider the same problem from the point of view of RANs, it's basically a 1D problem. It's a fully developed, right? Fully developed in both sets, fully, fully, fully thermally developed as well as fully hydrodynamically developed. So effectively, values are changing only in the world normal direction. So that's why it's a one big problem in RANS. So just to give you an idea, I'm not going to read it for you to appreciate. The relative cost. Okay. Again, what infrastructure I used is immaterial. I think the relative proportion just comes with that. Okay. Because depending upon the numerical method used, how you actually solve the equations, that can change, but I think the relative magnitude will not change much. So, I've considered these models. As I said, in these three cases, qual function is needed. We use non-equilibrium qual function. Velocity, this part U plus equal to Y plus is valid for the discus sub lab that comes from your previous fluid dynamic knowledge. Log layer basically is given by this, and you can see 
this is the DNS result for these two cases. And if you look at this is how you will get from the DNS, K epsilon longer and normal. We used grid size, which is y plus equal to point three. You can't distinguish with respect to DNS. Right? Does quite good job, but there's a part. Y plus point three is fine for a 1D problem. When you are going for a complex geometry, ensuring y plus point three everywhere in the domain is a tall order. Okay. So please consider that. Let's now actually see how this models behaved for different section Reynolds number 180, 395, 640, 1020. I will tell this is well. Okay. Now, if we consider how we are capturing the Reynolds stresses, these are the normal stresses in the streamwise direction. Black line is DNS. The other broken lines are K ohm, epsilon, longer and norma, and K omega SST. Some of the models are not shown in this place because they are wall function. They are not solved up to the uh, wall. You can see mean flow, when I showed the mean flow profile u plus y plus, which is basically normalized mean velocity, performance was good. When it comes to the stress prediction, this models that longer and Sharma, k omega, k omega SST, standard k epsilon, they do a very good job. Problem is same. Hmm? Problem is same. Problem is same. Essentially, I am taking all the results corresponding to these simulations. Probably it won't surprise you that two models which are close to DNS data are LRR model and SSG model, which are basically the Reynolds stress closure model. as bad as the, the, the normal stress uh, in the streamwise direction, but T prime, T prime, which is basically the well, normal one, but still there are discrepancies between K epsilon, longer and Sharma, K omega, SST with the DNS data. But it becomes better away from the wall. Clear? K, when you consider under prediction or no prediction, they are compensating. As a result, K prediction is not bad, actually. This is something which I mentioned yesterday, that very often when you are doing RAN simulation or LEA simulation, you can have a situation that one error canceling other and it looks quite good doesn't mean physically it is doing the correct thing. Clear? This is U prime, V prime. That's the shear Reynolds stress. And you will see all the models are doing excellent job. Why? Because they are benchmarked to give you the shear stress properly. So, values based on the quantities based on which they are benchmarked, they do a very good job. As soon as you actually start to predict things for which they are not benchmarked, then it starts to show <coughs> problems. Clear? So hopefully this is the 
final proof of what essentially these models do and their performance. That's my final answer to your question. So there will be extra time because of the fluctuations of pressure and dilatation rate in turbulent magnetic energy Reynolds stress transport equation, and you can't ignore them. There are not any kind of all-purpose models for those terms. The reason I'm telling, let's say you are talking about a compressible flow around a supersonic beam. The dilatation rate, that means divergence of velocity, can be both positive and negative. Some places flow goes through expansion, some places it goes through compression. In the case of combustion, dilatation rate is going to be mostly positive because of thermal expansion, because it's mostly thermal expansion is taking place. Physics are completely different. As a result, it's very difficult to come up with a model which will work for compressible non-reacting flow as well as for compressible reacting flow. Clear? Again, pressure transport term is going to be affected because of the non-zero dilatation rate. There will be extra contribution for the, the dilatation rate in the viscous contribution. I showed that yesterday once. Bucini's hypothesis and AD viscosity expressions may not be exactly valid as I showed in this lecture for incompressible flow in the presence of compressible. Reacting flows, the modeling of turbulent stresses are often related to turbulent combustion modeling because the compressibility effect arises from chemical reaction. So there will be some extra terms which is coming because of the chemical reaction effects. Okay. With that, now we are entering, we are leaving plans for the time being, moving to large initial The subgrid stress tensor is given by this. If you, at this point, bar effectively is filtered operation, theta means pepper filtered value. Previously, we had rho ui prime uj prime bar. If you do this thing in the context of RANS, you will recover from this expression rho u prime bar, uh, sorry, uh, from rho u prime u, uh, ui prime uj prime bar in the context of RANS. Rest of the equation looks fine. Now, if we consider the isotropic part as well, very often that this part can be added to the filter pressure term and taken together. So this is often modeled in this way, where SIJ tilde is given in this term. It's a resolved strain tensor. CS is Magarinsky model constant, as I told you before. Generally, this is the theoretical value. And very often, people use values different to this one. So keep that in mind. Although this is the theoretical value, you will see a range of different values of Magarinsky in the literature. But this is originally the value which was proposed. Now you can ask why people use those other values. Because it is not a secret that this model doesn't work. They basically kill the value until they get to the That's not necessarily 
a very rigorous science, but they basically benchmark their simulation methodology based on which they start to get something sensible. Okay. One possibility is to actually, rather than assuming a value, evaluate the value of Cd square, which we are calling Cd, on the fly. You remember in the morning, at the end, I talked about dynamic modeling. That means you actually look at the local flow features, and from there you extract the value for the model also. And that's what is done here. Where, effectively, when you are seeing this top hat, this is filtering operations. So you get the first filtered value as a part of solution of your LES, then you do explicit filtering on the values which you got from your ideas. Okay? And from there you can actually express the right hand side in this manner and you can get the value of C. So you don't have to specify any value a priori. The value is extracted as the simulation progresses. Clear? This one is a relatively recent model. You can see. So what is the model? This one, the hat. This hat is essentially the explicit filtering after you get the filtered values in the areas. There is no other better way of showing it. This is called sigma model, expressed in this way where essentially this is basically the eigen vectors based on this thing. So there are various ways to actually model the subway stress. One is called Clark's tensor um, model, even in this form. It is basically invokes scale similarity. Basically, it's telling that whatever I am seeing in the resolved scale that is happening in the subway scale. And it is strictly valid for small filter weights, but it has been found that it actually does a reasonably good job for wide range of applications. This is scale similarity. Why? Look at the functional form of this. This looks similar to this one, isn't it? That's basically scale similarity. I will tell that I'll evaluate the same kind of quantity based on my resolved values, but I'm, this time I'm actually explicitly filtering. I'm getting these ones, but now I'm filtering. Okay? And I will tell this as I am already resolving my flow field, my subgrade behavior will be similar to this. As the name suggests, I am telling that similarity exists between different scales. That's the idea. This was not, the scale similarity was applied only in this part. If I want to actually consider the scale similarity including the density weighting, then it looks something like this. Double power means filtering twice. I told yesterday, filtered value in the context of Reynolds averaging, mean of a mean is equal to the mean. But in the filtered sense, that's not the case. Yeah. So please keep that in mind. This is relatively mean. It's a, it's basically has two test filter levels. This is a relatively recent closure. And another alternative 
is that adding the isotropic part of the tensor to the filter pressure and basically model that in this manner. So if we consider this kind of thing, the combined model will be called SSY model in this lecture. I mentioned paper, but basically I meant this lecture. The original model had this constant, but a wide range of values people used in the past. So, I'll show you the behavior of the models for a reacting flow case. Okay? These are the direct numerical simulation results for high statistically planar printing plane. These are different Lewis numbers, different turbulence intensity remains exactly the same length scale separation between integral length scale and plane thickness remains exactly the same. This is called heat release parameter, basically it is defined as T adiabatic, adiabatic plane temperature to the unburned gas temperature minus 1. It gives you effectively the is linked to the density ratio between the unburned gas to the burned gas. If you add 1 to that number, it gives you the ratio between the unburned gas and the burned gas. Okay. Another one where we change the turbulence intensity and the next scale ratio. For three of the cases, you will see the damp color number was not different, part of this number was changed, and in three of the cases, part of this number was the same. Uh, Tampola number was unchanged. Discuss for Tampola number and part of this number are yesterday. Just to remind you, Tampola number is the ratio of large scale, turbulent time scale, chemical time scale. And part of this number is the chemical time scale, the whole number of time scale. How they look like? These are not huge simulations in modern best time. This one perhaps is, but this two you can do fairly easily nowadays. Okay, this is how the flames look like. It becomes, we are looking at it from the unborn gas side, and as the, the <coughs> color becomes more red, we are going towards the burn gas side. Okay. A22, D2, E2, that means turbulence intensity. This is, you can see, flame becomes more wrinkled, more convoluted, flame elements start to interact with each other. <coughs> now, behavior of that. Here, cosine of angle of theta between the subprint stress calculated directly from TNS, and this one, predictions based on the model. Okay. And you can see effectively I have shown it for different filter widths. As the filter width increases, you see this variation. If model is correct, they should align right with each other. Angle. Somebody was asking me yesterday, I can't remember, that how to actually assess the model based on the TNS data. This is what is done. We are, perhaps you were asking it. That, that, that what we did, we use the DNS data explicitly filtered it to get the unclosed terms exactly on the left hand side. I think probably you, isn't it? That's what you were asking. So we explicitly evaluated the subway stress directly from DNS data. On the right hand side, we also evaluated based on the three different quantities. Now, if you have perfect match between the model and DNS, it should be there will be no difference in the direction, isn't it? 
So. You can see this is the situation. If there is no difference between them, perfect alignment. Perfect alignment means what? Cos zero. Cos zero is what? One. Right? One is here. That's what we are getting. So effectively. It's not only not aligned, it is actually giving you the opposite sign. Not even the right sign. If we increase the, if you look at the tau 1, that means it's in the direction of mean flame propagation. If we look at the transverse direction, at least it's positive most of the time. At least qualitatively, to some extent, correct. But still far from positive. As I said, negative cos theta indicates opposite alignment. In other words, counter gradient behavior. Counter gradient transport increases in the direction of mean flow time propagation. Sim counter gradient increases in decreasing heat release or less number. If you actually reduce the strength of the heat release rate or if you decrease less number, that means practically what it means you are moving from standard hydrocarbon fuel to hydrogen rich fuels, that behavior will become strengthened. Okay? So essentially, we we'll show this behavior is qualitatively similar to turbulent scalar flux. Whether you will have counter gradient transport or gradient transport, it depends on two competitions. Uh, sorry, the competition of two quantities. Heat release due to combustion basically induces certain fluctuation. Background turbulence gives rise to fluctuation. The competition between these two determines whether you will have gradient or counter gradient. If the background turbulence affects queens, you see gradient behavior. If the heat release, thermal expansion due to heat release wins over the background turbulence, you see counter gradient. Okay? This is one way to actually show the anisotropic uh, of the subgrid stress. Basically, here is a perfect isotropy. Here, two component means one of the component of the, the stress uh, uh, component will be, be small. Here, you have ex symmetric ex expansion and symmetric contraction. I don't have the full time to actually go through this, but. Please look at Lumley Triangle, it's a very, very useful way to actually categorize how an isotropic your stress tensor is valid for both subgrid stresses as well as renal stresses. And it is actually based on the second invariant and hard invariant of the deviatory part of your stress tensor. So, when you have Lewis number much, much less than one, that's likely to happen for hydrogen flames, you are going to see strong effects of anisotropy. Axis metric expansion, where flow status planar flame in the mean direction aligned with x1 axis, that means it's basically in the direction of mean flow propagation. 
all the simulations started with the initial isotropic turbulent field. So A1, which is this case, the anisotropy remains in the bottom gas side as well. How about dynamic modeling? If you look at the dynamically evaluated model constant, you can see it is varying all over the place. There is no trend, you can see, here. And actually, we are showing the model constant as a function of x. Sometimes, even the model constant gives you a value of negative value. Remember, CD, I defined as C A square. A square value is giving you negative thing. Does it sound physical? No. Clearly, model is failing. In the case of dynamic modeling, after you do the operation, you need to average it. Conventional averaging actually fails in reacting to a situation. If you actually consider that you are going to yield condition yield average for a given value of C tilde, that's the reaction progress variable which I told you yesterday. C zero means unburned gas, one means fully burned gas. This is temperate filter value of reaction progress variable. And if I average it only conditionally over that, this is what you are going to get. But still C that for low turbulence intensity cases, I am getting negative value. Okay. For high turbulence intensity cases, effectively you are getting somewhere here, which is close to the, the theoretical value of 0.18 square. So at high turbulence intensity, in a combustion scenario, it behaves like a non-reacting flow. But low turbulence intensity, as I told, the transport process induced by thermal expansion process wins over the turbulent fluctuation and it shows counter gradient behavior. So when you are seeing CD negative, clearly your model is not working, it is giving you something unphysical, suggests counter gradient behavior. Okay? Please note that turbulent Randall number, turbulent speed number, these concepts are valid only for gradient type of transport. If it is counter gradient, forget about those things, go, those things go out of the window, they have no meaning whatsoever. Clear? Whatever I have mentioned, those are, if we look at something more that if we look at how the behavior is, this is the, the, the sigma model behavior as Magoreski model behavior, this one is Magoreski model. This way the filter width increases, turbulence intensity increases. As you can see, as the turbulence intensity increases, the ratio of any viscosity in the context of LES divided by the kinematic viscosity. Because more fluid motion is taking place at the subfluid level and thus reflected in higher levels. I told that CI value which people used is a wide range of things. Originally proposed close to 0 0.09 but people use from point zero, from one order magnitude less to that value. So we dynamically evaluated these values. You can see, again, as the filter size increases, U prime increases this value actually increase. And here are the correlation coefficients, because these are all three dimensional quantities. So I can actually find out the correlation coefficient of the exact value extracted from DNS and the model. 
if model does perfect job, I should get a correlation coefficient of 1, right? And negative correlation coefficient means counter gradient behavior. Model is actually failing to capture even the qualitative behavior as well as no hope whatsoever. Okay? So, basically, that, that is summarized here, so I am not going into that. If we go into the quantitative predictions, the, the red dots are DNS, you can see how they predict standards matter is is nowhere close, as you can see, showing just the opposite sign as well in some of these cases. Other models are doing better jobs. Basically, these are the main outcomes. Eddie viscosity models often predict wrong sign in terms of the plane normal. Modeling of the isotropic part improves the results. Scale similarity in test models perform reasonably well. But scale similarity models are not based on any viscosity prediction. Once again, you are basically taking the expression as it stands with a separate stress and you are telling Okay, I'm going to actually replace the instantaneous values by the filtered values. And I'm assuming the same thing, same physics is taking place in the result scale as well, and that's how I'm going to capture the data. So I'm not explicitly putting any kind of any discussion. This is important. There is no single model works for all cases equal. Okay. You also need to have the subway scale kinetic energy estimation. So I told that you actually have a wide range of values of this CI. If you use Clark's transport model and use this one, one gets nine terms out of 12 terms in the Yoshijawa's model. And effectively, based on that, you can get this range of constants there. So I'll do the analysis here based on CI 1 upon 24 and effectively the same model mathematically can be expressed in this manner. Okay? There is a trick here which I have intentionally introduced. Those of you who have done CMD, you must have actually discretized the second order terms, second order derivatives. If I consider one dimensional T plus Tw minus 2 Tp divided by delta x square or something like that, you must have done, right? At least that's the second order one. Higher order one will have other things. So, think about it, I have a second order derivative here, right? I have also a second order derivative here, and the value multiplied by this. So, if think about it, that discretization term, I can actually discretize this relatively well. If I consider, in the analysis, when I Put the derivatives based on the equivalent DNS grid, then the results look like this for relation coefficient 1 and you can see. Class model does a very good job, correlation coefficient close to 1. Yoshijawa's model is slightly smaller. For 
any is great, this trend, this scale similarity model does a really good job. Again, the Clark's model, based on another scale similarity, does a comparable job. Correlations the lower on the
this model, this way of writing that model and, and discretizing it gives you better prediction than the original one. Okay? Mathematically identical numerical treatment is different. So this is another example how numerical and modeling errors are related and how they interact, how you implement it in your code. That makes a huge difference. In general, huge scope for improvement of the modeling. It's a very, very dynamic field. Things are not resolved at all. There is huge scope for improvement. Somebody is asked, was asking me yesterday uh, where people can contribute everywhere <laughs> effectively. With that, hopefully, you can actually understand different closure strategies for turbulent and summary stresses. Hopefully, you will now know that limitations as well as the strengths of different models. Compressibility plays a very, very important role in the closure. And especially in the case of reacting flows, the conventional models for the LES closure, I've just shown for LES closure, which is valid for the RANS as well. There's a huge scope for improvement the existing models often don't work. And with that, we'll stop at this point.